As an assistant headmaster, I had not taught my beloved Roman history in many years, so that pouring through my reams of notes was like returning at last to my childhood home. I stopped here and there among the files. I reread the term paper of young Derek Bach, entitled The Search of Diogenes, and the scrawled one of James Watson called Archimedes' Method. Among the art projects, I found John Updike's reproduction of the obelisk of Cleopatra and a charcoal drawing of the Baths of Carcola by the abstract expressionist Robert Motherwell, unfortunately torn in two and no longer worth anything. I had always been a diligent note-taker. Furthermore, and I believe that what I came up with was a surprisingly accurate reproduction of the subjects on which I had once quizzed Fred Masudi, Deepak Mehta, and Cedric Bell. Nearly half a century before, it took me only two evenings to gather enough material for the task. Although in order not to appear eager, I waited several days before sending off another letter to Cedric Bell. He called me soon after. It is indeed a surprise to one who toils for his own keep to see the formidable strokes with which our captains of industry demolish the task before them. The morning after talking to Sedgwick Bell, I received calls from two of his secretaries, a social assistant and a woman at a New York travel agency, who confirmed the arrangements for late July. Two months hence, the event was to take place on an island off the outer banks of Carolina that belonged to East America Steel, and I sent along a list from the St. Benedict's archive so that everyone in Sedgwick Bell's class would be invited. I was not prepared, however, for the days of retirement that intervened, what little remained of that school year passed speedily in my preoccupation, and before I knew it, the boys were taking their final exams. I tried not to think about my future. At the commencement exercises in June, a small section of the ceremony was spent in my honor, but it was presided over by Charles Ellerby and gave rise to a taste of copper in my throat. And thus we bid adieu, he began, to our beloved Mr. Hundert. He gazed out over the lectern, extended his arm in my direction, and proceeded to give a nostalgic rendering of my years at the school to the audience of jacketed businessmen Paris old ladies, students in St. Benedict's blazers, and children in church suits, who, like me, were squirming at the meretriciousness of the man. Yet how quickly it was over! Awards were presented, Hail Fair Benedict's was sung, and as the birches began to lean their narrow shadow shadows against the distant edge of the marsh, the seniors came forward to receive their diplomas. The mothers wept. The alumni stood misty-eyed, and the graduates threw their hats into the air. Afterward, everyone dispersed for the headmaster's reception. I wish now that I had made an appearance there, for to have missed it, the very last one of my career, was a far more grievous blow to me than to Charles Ellerby. Furthermore, the handful of senior boys who, over their tenure, had been pierced by the bee sting of history no doubt missed my presence, or at least wondered at its lack. I spent the remainder of the afternoon in my house, and the evening walking out along the marsh, where the smell of wood smoke from a farmer's bonfire and the distant sounds of the gathered celebrants filled me with the great, sad pride of teaching. My boys were passing once again into the world without me. The next day, of course, parents began arriving to claim their children. Jitney buses ferried students to airports and train stations. The groundsmen went around pulling up lacrosse goals and baseball bleachers, hauling the long black sprinkler hoses behind his tractor into the fields. I spent most of that day and the next one sitting at the desk in my study, watching through the window as the school wound down like a clock, spring toward the strange bird-filled calm of that second afternoon of my retirement. When all the boys had left and I was alone, once again in this eerie quiet of the summer, I owned few things besides my files and books. I packed them, and the next day my groundsman drove me into Woodmere. There I found lodging in a splendid Victorian rooming house run by the, a descendant of Nat Turner, who joked when I told her that I was a newly retired teacher 
about how the house had always welcomed, welcomed escaped slaves. I was surprised at how heartily I laughed at this, which had the benefit of putting me instantly on good terms with the landlady. We negotiated a monthly rent, and I went upstairs to set about charting a new life for myself. I was 68 years old, yes, perhaps too old to be headmaster, but I could still walk three miles before dinner, and did so the first afternoon of my freedom. However, by evening my spirits had taken a beating. Fortunately, there was the event to prepare for, as I fear that without it, those first days and nights would have been unbearable. I pored again and again over my old notes, extracting devilish questions from the material. But this only occupied a few hours of the day, and by the late morning my eyes would grow weary. Objectively speaking, the start of that summer should have been no different from the start of any other, yet it was. Passing my reflection in the hallway mirror on my way down to dinner, I would think to myself, is that you? And on the way back to my room, what now? I wrote letters to my brothers and sisters and to several of my formal boys, the days crawled by, I reintroduced myself to the town librarian. I made the acquaintance of a retired railroad man who liked as much as I did to sit on the grand screen porch of that house. I took the bus into Washington a few times to spend the day in the museum. But as the summer progressed, a certain dread began to form in my mind, which I tried through the diligence of walking, museum going, and reading to ignore, and that is. I began to fear that Sedgwick Bell had forgotten about the event. The thought would occur to me in the midst of the long path along the outskirts of the town, and as I reached the pacific took my break and then started back again toward home, I would battle with my urge to contact the man. Several times I went to the telephone downstairs in the rooming house, and twice I wrote out letters that I did not send. Why would he go through all the trouble just to mock me? I thought, but then I would recall the circumstances of his tenure at St. Benedict's, and a darker gloom would descend upon me. I began to have second thoughts about events that had occurred half a century before. Should I have confronted him in the midst of the original contest? Should I never even have leapfrogged another boy to get him there? Should I have spoken up to the senator? In early July, however, Sedgwick Bell's secretary finally did call and I felt that I had been given a reprieve. She apologized for her tardiness, asked me more questions about my taste in food and lodging, and then informed me of the date. Three weeks later, later when a car would call to take me to the airport in Williamsburg, an East America jet would fly me from there to Charlotte, from whence I was to be picked up by helicopter. Helicopter. Less than a month later, I stood before the craft which is painted head to tail in East America's green and gold insignia, polished to a shine with a six-man passenger bay and red, white, and blue sponsons over the wheel. One does not remain at St. Benedict's for five decades without gaining a certain familiarity with privilege, yet as it lifted me off, the pad in Charlotte hovered for a moment then lowered its nose and run eastward over the gentle hills, and then the chopping state of the sea channel, I felt the headlines that I had never known before. It was that Augustus Caesar must have felt. Millennia ago, carried head high on a litter past the taper, I dutched my notes to my chest. Indeed, I wondered what my life might have been like if I had felt this just once in my youth. The rotors buzzed like a swarm of bees above us. On the island, I was shown to a suite of rooms in the high corner of the launch, with windows and balconies overlooking the sea, for a conference on the future childhood education, or the plight of America's elderly, of course. You could not get one-tenth of these men to attend, but for a privileged romp on a private island, it had merely been a matter of making the arrangements. I stood at the window of my room and watched the helicopter ferry back and forth across the channel, disgorging on the island a who's who of America's largest corporations, universities, and organs of policy. Oh, but what it was to see the boys, after a time I made my way back out to the airstrip and whenever the craft touched down on the landing platform and one or another of my old students ducked out, 
clutching his suit label as he ran clear of the snapping rotors, I was struck anew with how great a privilege my profession had been. That evening, all of us ate together in the lodge, and the boys toasted me and took turns coming to my table, where several times one or another of them had to remind me to continue eating my food. Sedgwick Bell, ampled over with a charming air of modesty, showed me the flashcards of Roman history that he had been keeping in his desk at East America. Then, shedding his modesty, he went to the podium and produced a long and rashes toast referring to any number of pranks and misdeeds at saint benedict's that i had never even heard of but that the chorus of boys greeted with stamps and whistles at a quarter to nine they all dropped their forks onto the floor and i fear that tears came to my eyes the most poignant part of all however was how plainly the faces of the men still showed the eager expressiveness of first form boys of 41 years ago martin blythe had lost half of his leg as an officer in Korea, and now, among his classmates, he tried to hide his lurching stride, but he wore the same knitted brow that he used to wear in my classroom. Deepak Mehta, who had become a professor of Asian history, walked with a slight stoop, yet he still turned his eyes downward when spoken to. Fred Masudi seemed to have fared physically better than his mates, bouncing about in the Italian suit and alligator shoes of of the advertising industry, yet he was still drawn immediately to the other do-nothings from his class. But of course it was Sedgwick Bell who commanded everyone's attention. He had grown stout across the middle and bald over the crown of his head, and I saw in his ear, although it was artfully concealed, the fresh colored bulb of the hearing aid, yet he walked among the men like a prophet. Their faces grew animated when he approached and at the tables I could see them competing for his attention. He patted one on the back, whispered in the ear of another, gripped hands and grasped shoulders and kissed the wives on the lips. His walk was firm and imbued not with the seriousness of his post. It seemed to me, but with the ease of it, so that his stride among the tables was jocular. He was the host and clearly in his element. His laugh was voluble. I went to sleep early that evening so that the boys could enjoy themselves downstairs in the saloon, and as I lay in bed, I listened to their songs and revelry. It had not escaped my attention, of course, that they no doubt spent some time mocking me, but this is what one grows to expect in my post, and indeed it was part of the reason I left them alone. Although I was tempted to walk down and listen from outside the theater, I did not. The next day was spent walking the island's serpentine spread of coves and beaches, playing tennis on the grass court and paddling in wooden boats on the small inland lake behind the lodge. How quickly one grows accustomed to luxury. Men and women lounged on the decks and beaches and patios, sunning like seals, gorging themselves in the lagress of their post. As for me, I barely had a moment to myself. For the boys took turns at my entertainment. I walked with Deepak Mehta along the beach and succeeded in getting him to tell me the tale of his rise through academia to a post at Columbia University. Evidently, his career had taken a toll for although he looked healthy enough, he told me that he had recently had a small heart attack. It was not the type of thing one talked about with a student, however, so I let his revelation pass without comment. Later, Fred Masudi brought me onto the tennis court and tried to teach me to hit the ball, an activity that drew a crowd of boisterous guests to the stands. They roared at Fred's theatrical antics and cheered and stomped their feet whenever I sent one back across the net. In the afternoon, Martin Blythe took me out in a rowboat. St. Benedict's, of course, had always had a more profound effect than most schools on the lives of its students. Yet nonetheless, it was strange that once in the center of the pond, where he had rowed us with his lurching stroke, Martin Blythe set down the oars in their locks and told me he had something he'd always meant to ask me. Yes, I said. He brushed back his hair with his hand. I was supposed to be the one up there with Deepak and Fred. Wasn't I, sir? Don't tell me you're still thinking about that, 
It's just that I've sometimes wondered what happened. Yes, you should have been, I said. Oh, how little we understand of men if we think that their childhood slights are forgotten. He smiled. He did not press the subject further. And while I myself debated the merits of explaining why I had passed him over for Cedric Bell 41 years before, he pivoted the boat around and brought us back to shore. The confirmation of his suspicions was enough to satisfy him. It seemed so. I had said nothing more. He had been an Air Force major in our country's endeavors on the Korean Peninsula. Yet as he pulled the boat onto the beach, I had the clear feeling of having saved him from some torment. Indeed, that evening, when the guests had gathered in the lodge's small theater, and Deepak Mehta, Fern Masudi, and Cedric Bell had taken their seats for the reenactment of Mr. Julius Caesar, I noticed an ease in Martin Blythe's face that I believe I had never seen in it before. His brow was not knit, and he had crossed his legs so that above one sock we could clearly see the painted wooden calf. It was then that I noticed that the boys who had paid the most attention to me that day were in fact the ones sitting before me on the stage. How dreadful a thought this was, that they had indulged me to gain advantage. But I put it from my mind and stepped to the microphone. I had spent the late afternoon reviewing my notes, and the first rounds of questions were called from memory. The crowd did not fail to notice that feat. There were whistles and stomps when I named 15 of the first 16 emperors in order and asked Fred Masudi to produce the one I had left out. There was applause when I spoke Caesar's words, Il lacta alea esto, and then, continuing in carefully pronounced Latin, asked Cedric Bell to recall the circumstances of their utterance. He had told me that afternoon of months he had spent preparing, and as I was asking the question, he smiled. The boys had not worn togas, of course, although I personally feel they might have. Yet the situation was familiar enough that I felt a rush of unease as Sedgwick Bell smiled and waned, and he hesitated several moments before answering. But this time, 41 years later, he looked straight out into the audience and spoke his answers with the air of a scholar. It was not long before Fred Masudi had dropped out of course, but then, as it had before, the contest proceeded neck and neck between Cedric Bell and Deepak Mehta. I asked Cedric Bell about Caesar's battles at Pharsalus and Thaspus, about the shift of power to Constantinople, and about the war between the Patricians and the Plebeians. I asked Deepak Mehta about the Punic Wars, the conquest of Italy, and the fall of the Republic. Deepak, of course, had an advantage, for certainly he had studied this material at university. But I must say that the straightforward determination of Sedgwick Bell had begun to win my heart. I recalled the bashful manner in which he had shown me his flashcards at dinner the night before. And as I stood now before the microphone, I seemed to be in the throes of an affection for him that had long been under wraps. What year were the Romans routed at Lake Thrasymene? I asked him. He paused. 217 BC, I believe. Which general later became Scipio Africanus Major? Publicus Cornelius Scipio, sir, Deepak Mehta answered softly. It does not happen as often as one might think that an unintelligent boy becomes an intelligent man. For in my own experience, a love of thought is rooted in an age long before adolescence. Yet Cedric Bell now seemed to have done just that. His answers were spoken with the composed demeanor of a scholar. There is no one I like more, of course, than the man who is moved by the mere fact of history. And as I contemplated the next question to him, I wondered if I had indeed exaggerated the indolence of his boyhood. Was it true, perhaps, that he had simply not come into his element yet while at St. Benedict's? He peered intently at me from the stage. His elbows on his knees, I decided to ask him a difficult question. Chairman Bell, I said. Which tribes invaded Rome in 102 BC? His eyes went blank and he curled his shoulders in his suit. Although he was by then one of the most powerful men in America. And although moments before that, I had been rejoicing in his discipline, suddenly I saw him on the stage once again as a frightened boy 
How powerful is memory! And once again, I feared that it was I who had betrayed him. He brought his hand to his head to think. Take your time, sir, I offered. There were murmurs in the audience. He distractedly touched the side of his head. Man's character in his fate, says Heraclitus. And at that moment, as he brushed his hand down over his temple, I realized that the flesh-colored device in his ear was not a hearing aid, but a transmitter through which he was receiving the answers to my questions. Nausea rose in me. Of course, I had no proof, but was it not exactly what I should have expected? He touched his head once again and appeared to be deep in thought, and I knew as certainly as he had shown me. The Teutrons, he said haltingly. And I'll take a stab here, the Simbri. I looked for a long time at him. Did he know at that point what I was thinking? I cannot say. But after I had paused as long as I could bear to the, in front of the crowd, I cleared my throat and granted that he was right. Applause erupted. He shook it off with a wave of his hand. I knew that it was my duty to speak up. I knew it was my duty as a teacher to bring him clear of the moral dereliction in which I myself had been his partner. Yet at the same time, I felt myself adrift in the tide of my own vacillation and failure. The boy had somehow got hold of me again. He tried to quiet the applause with a wave of his hand, with his gesture only caused the clapping to increase. I am afraid to say that it was merely the sound of a throng of boisterous men that finally prevented me from making my stand. Quite suddenly, I was aware that this was not the situation I had known at St. Benedict's School. We were guests now of a significant man on his splendid estate, and to expose him would be a serious act indeed. I turned and quieted the crowd. From the chair next to Sedgwick Bell, Deepak Mehta merely looked at me, his eyes dark and resigned. Perhaps he too had just realized, or perhaps in the fact that he had long known, but in any case, I simply asked him the next question after he answered it. I could not do anything, but put another before Sedgwick Bell, then Deepak again, then Sedgwick, and again to Deepak. And it was only then, on the third round after I had discovered the boy, that an idea came to me. When I returned to Cedric Bell, I asked him, Who was Sutruk Noante? A few boys in the crowd began to laugh. And when Cedric Bell took his time thinking about the answer, more in the audience joined in. Whoever was the mercenary professor talking in his ear, it was clear to me that he would not know the answer to this one. For if he had not gone to St. Benedict's school, he would never have heard of Chetruk Naonti. In a few moments, sure enough, I saw Cedric Bell begin to grow uncomfortable. He lifted his pant leg and scratched at his sock. The laughter increased, and then I heard the wives, who had obviously never lived in a predatory pack, trying to stifle their husbands. Come on, Bell! someone shouted. Look at the dang door! Laughter erupted again. How can it be that, for a moment, my heart bled for him? He, too, tried to laugh, but only half-heartedly. He shifted in his seat, shook his arms loose in his suit, looked uncomprehendingly out at the snickering crowd, then braced his chin and said, Well, I guess if Deepak knows the answer to this one, then it's his ballgame. Deepak's response was nearly lost in the boisterous stamps and whistles that followed. For I am sure that every boy but Cedric recalled Henry Stimson's tablet above the door of my classroom. Yet what was strange was that I felt disappointment. As Deepak Mehta smiled, spoke the answer, and stood from his chair, I watched confusion, and then a flicker of panic crossed the face of Cedric Bell. He stood haltingly. How clear it was to me, then, that the corruption in his character had always arisen from fear. And I could not help remembering that as his teacher I had once tried to convince him of his stupidity. I cursed that day, but then in a moment he summoned a smile, called me up to the stage, and crossed theatrically to congratulate the victor. How can I describe the scene that took place next? 
I suppose I was naive to think that this was the end of the evening, or even the point of it. For after Sedgwick Bell had brought forth a trophy for Deepak Mehta, and then one for me as well, an entirely different cast came across his features. He strode once again to the podium and asked for the attention of the guests. He tapped sharply on the microphone, then he leaned his head forward, and in a voice that I recognized from long ago on a radio, a voice in whose deft leaps from boom to whisper, I heard the willow tree drawl of his father. He launched into it an address, dropping his volume at the moment, when a less gifted man would have raised it. We have opened our doors to all the world, he said, his voice thundering, then pausing, then plunging nearly to a murmur. And now the world has stripped us bare. He gestured his hands. The men in the audience, first laughing, now turned serious. We have given away too much for long, he said. We have handed our fiscal leadership to men who don't care about the taxpayers of our country and our moral course to those who no longer understand our role in history. Although he gestured to me here, I could not return his gaze. We have abandoned the moral education of our families. Scattered applause drifted up from his classmates and here, of course, I almost spoke. We have left our country adrift on dangerous seas. Now the applause was more hearty. Then he quieted his voice again, dropped his head as though in supplication and announced that he was running for the United States Senate. Why was I surprised? I should not have been, for since childhood, the boy had stood so near to the mantle of power that its shadow must have been as familiar to him as his boyhood home. Virtue had no place in the palaces he had known. I was ashamed when I realized he had contrived the entire rematch of Mr. Julius Caesar for no reason other than to gather his classmates for donations. Yet still, I chastened myself for not realizing his ambition before. In his oratory, in his physical presence, in his conviction, he had always possessed the gifts of a leader. And now, he was using them. I should have expected this from the first day he stood in his short pantsuit in the doorway of my classroom and silenced my students. He already wielded a potent role in the affairs of our country. He enjoyed the presumption of his family name. He was blindly ignorant of history and therefore did not fear his role in it. Of course, it was exactly the culmination I should long ago have seen. The crowd stood cheering. As soon as the copping abated, a curtain was lifted behind him, and a back struck up Dixie. Waiters appeared at the side doors. A dance platform was unfolded in the orchestra pit, and Cedric Bell jumped down from the stage into the crowd of his friends. They clamored around him. He patted shoulders, kissed wives, whispered and laughed and nodded his head. I saw checkbooks come out. The waiters carried champagne on trays at their shoulders, and at the edge of the dance floor, the women sit down their purses and stepped into the arms of their husbands. When I saw this, I ducked out a side door and returned to the lodge, for the abandon with which the guests were dancing was an unbearable counterpart to the truth I knew. One can imagine my feelings. I heard the din late into the night. Needless to say, I resolved to avoid the Hedwig Bell for the remainder of the, my stay. How my mind raced that night through humanity's endless history of injustice, depravity, and betrayal. I could not sleep, and several times I rose and went to the window to listen to the revelry. Standing at the glass, I felt like the spurned sovereign in the castle tower looking down from his balcony onto the procession of the false potentate. Yet, sure enough, my conviction soon began to wane. No sooner had I resolved to avoid my host than I began to doubt the veracity of my secret knowledge about him. Other thoughts came to me. How, in fact, had I been so sure of what he'd done? What proof had I at all? Amid the distant celebrations of the night, my conclusion began to seem far-fetched and by the quiet of the morning I was muddled. I did not go to breakfast. As boy after boy stopped by my rooms to wish me well, I assiduously avoided commenting on either 
Sedgwick Bell's performance on in his announcement for the Senate. On the beach that day, I endeavored to walk by myself, for by then I trusted neither my judgment of the incident nor my discretion within the boys. I spent the afternoon alone in a cove across the island. I did not speak to Sedgwick Bell the entire day. I managed to avoid him. In fact, until the next evening, by which time all but a few of the guests had left, when he came to bid farewell as I stood on the termic awaiting the helicopter for mainland. He walked out and motioned for me to stand back from the platform, but I pretended not to hear him and kept my eyes up to the sky. Suddenly the shining craft swooped in from beyond the wave break, turning the channel into a boil, pulled up in a hover and then touched down on its flag colored sponsons before us. The wind and noise could have thrown a man to the ground, and Cedric Bell seemed to pull at me like a magnet, but I did not retreat. It was he, finally, who ran out to me. He gripped his labels, ducked his head, and offered me his hand. I took it tentatively, the rotors whipping our jacket sleeves. I had been expecting this moment and had decided the night before what I was going to say. I leaned toward him. How long have you been hard of hearing? I asked. His smile dropped. I cannot imagine what I had become in that mind of the boy. Very good, Hundred, he said. Very good. I thought you might have known. My vindication was sweet, although now I see that it meant little. By then, I was on the ladder of the helicopter, but he pulled me toward him again and looked darkly into my eyes. And I see that you have not changed either, he said. Well, had I? As the craft lifted off and turned westward toward the bank of the clouds that hid the distant shoreline, I analyzed the situation with some care. The wooden turrets of the lodge grew smaller and they were lost in the trees. And I found it easier to think then for everything on that island had been imbued with the sheer power of the man. I relaxed a bit in my seat. One could say that in this case, indeed, had acted properly. For is it not the glory of our legal system that acquitting a guilty man is less heinous than convicting an innocent one? At the time of the contest, I certainly had no proof of Cedric Bell's behavior. Yet back in Woodmere, as I have intimidated, I found myself with a great deal of time on my hands, and it was not long before the incident began to replay itself in my mind, following the wooded trail toward the river or sitting in the breeze at dusk on the porch. I began to see that a different ending would have better served us all. Conviction had failed me again. I was well aware of the foolish consolation of my thoughts. Yet I vividly imagined what I should have done. I heard myself speaking up. I saw my resolute steps to his chair on the stage and the insidious flesh-colored device in my palm held up to the crowd. I heard him stammering as if to mock my inaction. However, stories of his electoral efforts soon began to appear in the papers. It was a year of spite and rancor in our country's politics. And the race in West Virginia was less a campaign than a brawl between gladiators. The incumbent was versed in treachery as Sedgwick Bell and over my morning tea I followed their battles. Sedgwick Bell called him a liar when he speaks and a crook when he acts. And he called Sedgwick Bell worst. A fistfight erupted when their campaigns crossed at an airport. I was revolted by the spectacle, but of course I was also intrigued. And I cannot deny that although I was rooting for the incumbent, a part of me was also cheered at each bit of news chronicling Sedgwick Bell's assault on his lead. Oh, why was this so? Are we all, at base, creatures without virtue? Is fervor the only thing we follow? Needless to say, that fall had been a difficult one in my life especially those afternoons when the St. Benedict's bus roared by the guest house in Woodmere, taking the boys to track meets. And perhaps the Senate race was nothing more than a healthy distraction for me. Indeed, I needed distractions.
to witness the turning of the leaves and to smell the apples in their barrels without hearing the sound of a hundred boys in the fields. After all, it was almost more than I could bear. My walks had grown longer, and several times I had crossed the river and ventured to the far end of the marsh, from where in the distance I could make out the blurred figures of St. Benedict's. I knew this was not good for me, and perhaps that is why, in late October of that year, when I read that Sedgwick Bell would be making a campaign stop at a coal miners' union hall near the Virginian border, I decided to go hear him speak. Perhaps by then the boy had become an obsession for me. I will admit this, for I am as unaware as anyone that time is but the thinnest bandage for our wounds. But on the other hand, the race had grown quite close and would have been of natural interest to anyone. Sedgwick Bell had drawn up himself up from underdog to challenger. Now it was clear that the election hinged on the votes of labor, and Sedgwick Bell, though he was the son of aristocrats and the chairman of a formidable corporation, began to cast himself as a champion of the working man. From newspaper reports, I gleamed that he was helped along by the power of his voice and bearing and I could easily imagine these men turning to him. I well knew the charisma of the boy. The day I arrived, and I packed a lunch and made the trip. As the bus wound west along the river valley, I envisioned the scene ahead and wondered whether Cedric Bell would at this point care to see me. Certainly, I represented some sort of truth to him about himself. Yet at the same time, I also seemed to have become a part of the very delusion that he had foisted on those around him. How far my boys would always stride upon the world stage, and how dearly I would always hope to change them. The bus arrived early, and I went inside the Union Hall to wait. Shortly before noon, the miners began to come in. I don't know what I had expected, but I was surprised to see them looking as though they had indeed just come out of the mines. They wore hard hats, their faces were stained with dust, and their gloves and tool belts hung at their waists. For some reason, I had worn my St. Benedict's blazer, which I now removed. Reporters began to filter in as well, and by the time the noon whistle blew, the crowd was overflowing from the hall. As the whistle subsided, I heard the thump-thump of his helicopter, and through the door a moment later I saw the twisters of dust as it hovered into my view from above. How clever was the man I had known as a boy. The craft had been repainted, the colors of military camouflage, but he had left the sponsons the red, white, and blue of their previous incarnation. He jumped from the side door when the craft was still a foot above the ground, entered the hall at a jog, and was greeted with an explosion of applause. His aides lined the stairs to the high platform on which the microphone stood under a banner and a flag. And as he crossed the crowd toward them, the miners jostled to be near him, knocking their knuckles against his hard hat, reaching for his hands and his shoulders, cheering like Romans at a chariot race. I do not need to report on his eloquence, for I have dwelled enough upon it. When he reached a staircase and ascended to the podium, stopping first at the landing to wave, and then at the top to salute the flag above him, jubilation swept among the throng. I knew then that he had succeeded in his efforts, that these miners counted him somehow as their own, so that when he actually spoke and they interrupted him with cheers, it was no more unexpected than the promises he made than to carry their interests with him to the Senate. He was masterful. I found my own arm upraised. Certainly, there were five hundred men in that hall, but there was only one with the St. Benedict's blazer over his shoulder and no hard hat on his head. So, of course, I should not have been surprised within a few minutes one of his aides appeared beside me and told me that the candidate had asked for me at the podium. At that moment, I saw Cedric Bell's glance pause for a moment on my face. There was a flicker on a smile on his lips, but then he looked away. Is there no battle other than the personal one? Was Sedgwick Bell at the point willing to risk the future of his political ideas for whatever childhood demon still remained to him? The next time he turned toward me, he gestured down at the floor, and in a moment the aide had pulled my arm and was escorting me toward the platform.
The crowd opened as we passed, and the miners in their ignorance and jubilation were reaching to shake my hand. This was indeed a heady feeling. I climbed the steps and stood beside Cedric Bell at the smaller microphone. How is to stand above the mass of men like that? He raised his hand, and they cheered. He lowered it, and they fell silent. There is a man here today who has been immeasurably important in my life, he whispered in his microphone. There was applause, and a few men whistled. Thank you, I said into my own. I could see the blue underbrims of 500 hard hats turned up toward me. My heart was nearly bursting. My history teacher, he said. As the crowd began to cheer again, flashbulbs popped and I moved instinctively toward front of the platform. Mr. Hunter, he boomed, from 45 years ago at Richmond Central High School. It took me a moment to realize what he had said, but then he too was clapping and at the same time lowering his head in mu must have appeared to the men below to be respect for me. The blood engorged my veins. Just a minute, I said, stepping back to my own microphone. I taught you at St. Benedict School in Woodmere, Virginia. Here is the blazer. Of course, it makes no difference in the course of history that as I try to hold up the coat, Cedric Bell moved swiftly across the podium, took it from my grip, and raised my arm high in his own and that this pose, of all things, sent the miners into jubilation. It makes no difference that by the time I spoke, he had gestured with his hands so that one of his aides had already shut off my microphone. One does not alter history without conviction. It is enough to know that I did speak, and certainly a consolation that Sedgwick Bell realized, finally, that I would. He won that election not in small part because he managed to convince those miners that he was one of them. They were ignorant people, and I cannot blame them for taking to the shrewdly populist rhetoric of the man. I saved the picture that appeared the following morning in the Gazette. Senator Bell radiating all the populist magnetism of his father, holding high the arm of an old man who has on his face the remains of a proud and foolish smile. I still live in Woodmere, and I have found a route that I take now and then to the single high hill from which I can see the St. Benedict steeple across the Pasmic. I take two walks every day and have grown used to this life. I've even come to like it. I'm reading of the ancient Japanese civilizations now, which I had somehow neglected before, and every so often one of my boys visits me. One afternoon, recently, Deepak Mehta did so, and we shared some brandy. This was in the fall of the last year. He was still the quiet boy he had always been. And not long after he had taken a seat on my couch, I had to turn on the television to ease for him the burden of conversation. As it happened, the Senate Judiciary Committee was holding its famous hearings then, and the two of us sat there watching nodding our heads, or chuckling whenever the camera showed Cedric Bell sitting alongside the chairman. I had poured the brandy liberally, and whenever Cedric Bell leaned into the microphone and asked a question of the witness, Deepak would mimic his affected southern drawl. Naturally, I could not exactly encourage this behavior, but I had nothing to stop it. When he finished his drink, I poured him another. This, of course, is perhaps the greatest pleasure of a teacher's life, to have a drink one day with a man he has known as a boy. Nonetheless, I only wish we could have talked more than we actually did, but I am afraid that there must always be a return between a teacher and a student. Deepak had had another small heart attack, he told me, but I felt it would have been improper of me to inquire more. I tried to bring myself to broach the subject of Cedric Bell's history, but here again I was aware that a teacher does not discuss one boy with another. Certainly, Deepak must have known about Cedric Bell as well, but probably because of his own set of St. Benedict's morals, he did not bring it up with me. We watched Cedric Bell question the witness and then whisper into the ear of the chairman. Neither of us was surprised at his ascendance, I believe. 
because both of us were students of history. Yet we did not discuss this either. Still, I wanted desperately for him to ask me something more. And perhaps this was why I kept refilling his glass. I wanted him to ask, How's it to be alone, sir, at this age? Or perhaps to say, You have made a difference in my life, Mr. Hunter. But of course, there were not things Deepak Mehta would ever say. A man's character is his character, nonetheless. It was startling. Every now and then, when I looked over at the sunlight falling across his bald head, to see that Deepak Mehta, the quietest of my boys, was now an old man. had stood so near to the mantle of power that its shadow must have been as familiar to him as his boyhood home. Virtue had no place in the palaces he had known. I was ashamed when I realized he had contrived the entire rematch of Mr. Julius Caesar for no reason other than to gather his classmates for donations. Yet still, I chastened myself for not realizing his ambition before. In his oratory, in his physical presence, in his conviction, he had always possessed the gifts of a leader, and now he was using them. I should have expected this from the first day he stood in his short pantsuit in the doorway of my classroom and silenced my students. He already wielded a potent role in the affairs of our country. He enjoyed the presumption of his family name. He was blindly ignorant of history and therefore did not fear his role in it. Of course, it was exactly the culmination I should long ago have seen. The crowd stood cheering. As soon as the clapping abated, a curtain was lifted behind him, and a back struck up Dixie. Waiters appeared at the side doors. A dance platform was unfolded in the orchestra pit, and Cedric Bell jumped down from the stage into the crowd of his friends. They clamored around him. He patted shoulders, kissed wives, whispered and laughed and nodded his head. I saw checkbooks come out. The waiters carried champagne on trays at their shoulders. And at the edge of the dance floor, the women sit down their purses and stepped into the arms of their husbands. When I saw this, I ducked out a side door and returned to the lodge for the abandon with which the guests were dancing was an unbearable counterpart to the truth I knew. One can imagine my feelings. I heard the din late into the night. Needless to say, I resolved to avoid the Hedwig Bell for the remainder of the, my stay. How my mind raced that night through humanity's endless history of injustice, depravity, and betrayal. I could not sleep, and several times I rose and went to the window to listen to the revelry. Standing at the glass, I felt like the spurned sovereign in the castle tower looking down from his balcony onto the procession of the false potentate. Yet, sure enough, my conviction soon began to wane. No sooner had I resolved to avoid my host than I began to doubt the veracity of my secret knowledge about him. Other thoughts came to me. How, in fact, had I been so sure of what he'd done? What proof had I at all? Amid the distant celebrations of the night, my conclusion began to seem far-fetched, and by the quiet of the morning I was muddled. I did not go to breakfast. As boy after boy stopped by my rooms to wish me well, I assiduously avoided commenting on either Sedgwick Bell's performance or on his announcement for the Senate. On the beach that day, I endeavored to walk by myself. For by then, I trusted neither my judgment of the incident nor my discretion within the boys. I spent the afternoon alone in a cove across the island. I did not speak to Sedgwick Bell the entire day. I managed to avoid him. In fact, until the next evening, by which time all but a few of the guests had left, when he came to bid farewell as I stood on the termic awaiting the helicopter for mainland. He walked out and motioned for me to stand back from the platform, but I pretended not to hear him and kept my eyes up to the sky. Suddenly the shining craft swooped in from beyond the wave break, turning the channel into a boil. <laughs>
pulled up in a hover, and then touched down on its flat-colored sponsons before us. The wind and noise could have thrown a man to the ground, and Cedric Bell seemed to pull at me like a magnet, but I did not retreat. It was he, finally, who ran out to me. He gripped his lapels, ducked his head, and offered me his hand. I took it tentatively, the rotors whipping our jacket sleeves. I had been expecting this moment, and had decided the night before what I was going to say. I leaned toward him. How long have you been hard of hearing? I asked. His smile dropped. I cannot imagine what I had become in that mind of the boy. Very good, Hundred, he said. Very good. I thought you might have known. My vindication was sweet, although now I see that it meant little. By then, I was on the ladder of the helicopter, but he pulled me toward him again and looked darkly into my eyes. And I see that you have not changed either, he said. Well, had I? As the craft lifted off and turned westward toward the bank of the clouds that hid the distant shoreline, I analyzed the situation with some care. The wooden turrets of the lodge grew smaller and they were lost in the trees. And I found it easier to think then, for everything on that island had been imbued with the sheer power of the man. I relaxed a bit in my seat. One could say that in this case, indeed, had acted properly. For is it not the glory of our legal system that acquitting a guilty man is less heinous than convicting an innocent one? At the time of the contest, I certainly had no proof of Cedric Bell's behavior. Yet back in Woodmere, as I have intimidated, I found myself with a great deal of time on my hands. And it was not long before the incident began to replay itself in my mind following the wooded trail toward the river or sitting in the breeze at dusk on the porch, I began to see that a different ending would have better served us all. Conviction had failed me again. I was well aware of the foolish consolation of my thoughts, yet I vividly imagined what I should have done. I heard myself speaking up. I saw my resolute steps to his chair on the stage and the insidious flesh-colored device in my palm held up to the crowd. I heard him stammering, as if to mock my inaction. However, stories of his electoral efforts soon began to appear in the papers. It was a year of spite and rancor in our country's politics, and the race in West Virginia was less a campaign than a brawl between gladiators. The incumbent was versed in treachery as Sedgwick Bell, and over my morning tea I followed their battles. Sedgwick Bell called him a liar when he speaks, and a crook when he acts. And he called Cedric Bell worst. A fistfight erupted when their campaigns crossed at an airport. I was revolted by the spectacle, but of course, I was also intrigued. And I cannot deny that although I was rooting for the incumbent, a part of me was also cheered at each bit of news chronicling Cedric Bell's assault on his lead. Oh, why was this so? Are we all, at base, creatures without virtue? Is fervor the only thing we follow? Needless to say, that fall had been a difficult one in my life. Especially those afternoons when the St. Benedict's bus roared by the guest house in Woodmere, taking the boys to track meets. And perhaps the Senate race was nothing more than a healthy distraction for me. Indeed, I needed distractions. To witness the turning of the leaves and to smell the apples in their barrels without hearing the sound of a hundred boys in the fields. After all, it was almost more than I could bear. My walks had grown longer, and several times I had crossed the river and ventured to the far end of the marsh, from where in the distance I could make out the blurred figures of St. Benedict's. I knew this was not good for me, and perhaps that is why. In late October of that year, when I read that Sedgwick Bell would be making a campaign stop at a coal miners union hall near the Virginia border, I decided to go hear him speak. Perhaps by then the boy had become an obsession for me. I will admit this, for I am as unaware as anyone that time is but the thinnest bandage for our wounds. But on the other hand, 
the race had grown quite close and would have been of natural interest to anyone. Sedgwick Bell had drawn up himself up from underdog to challenger. Now it was clear that the election hinged on the votes of labor, and Sedgwick Bell, though he was a son of aristocrats and the chairman of a formidable corporation, began to cast himself as a champion of the working man. From newspaper reports, I gleaned that he was helped along by the power of his voice and bearing, and I could easily imagine these men turning to him. I well knew the charisma of the boy. The day I arrived, and I packed a lunch and made the trip. As the bus wound west along the river valley, I envisioned the scene ahead and wondered whether Cedric Bell would at this point care to see me. Certainly, I represented some sort of truth to him about himself. Yet at the same time, I also seemed to have become a part of the very delusion that he had foisted on those around him. How far my boys would always stride upon the world stage, and how dearly I would always hope to change them. The bus arrived early, and I went inside the Union Hall to wait. Shortly before noon, the miners began to come in. I don't know what I had expected, but I was surprised to see them looking as though they had indeed just come out of the mines. They wore hard hats, their faces were stained with dust, and their gloves and tool belts hung at their waists. For some reason, I had worn my St. Benedict's blazer, which I now removed. Reporters began to filter in as well, and by the time the noon whistle blew, the crowd was overflowing from the hall. As the whistle subsided, I heard the thump-thump of his helicopter, and through the door a moment later I saw the twisters of dust as it hovered into my view from above. How clever was the man I had known as a boy. The craft had been repainted, the colors of military camouflage, but he had left the sponsons the red, white, and blue of their previous incarnation. He jumped from the side door when the craft was still a foot above the ground, entered the hall at a jog, and was greeted with an explosion of applause. His aides lined the stairs to the high platform on which the microphone stood under a banner and a flag. And as he crossed the crowd toward them, the miners jostled to be near him, knocking their knuckles against his hard hat, reaching for his hands and his shoulders, cheering like Romans at a chariot race. I do not need to report on his eloquence, for I have dwelled enough upon it. When he reached a staircase and ascended to the podium, stopping first at the landing to wave, and then at the top to salute the flag above him, jubilation swept among the throng. I knew then that he had succeeded in his efforts, that these miners counted him somehow as their own, so that when he actually spoke and they interrupted him with cheers, it was no more unexpected than the promises he made than to carry their interests with him to the Senate. He was masterful. I found my own arm upraised. Certainly, there were five hundred men in that hall, but there was only one with the St. Benedict's blazer over his shoulder and no hard hat on his head. So, of course, I should not have been surprised when in a few minutes one of his aides appeared beside me and told me that the candidate had asked for me at the podium. At that moment, I saw Cedric Bell's glance pause for a moment on my face. There was a flicker on a smile on his lips, but then he looked away. Is there no battle other than the personal one? Was Cedric Bell at the point willing to risk the future of his political ideas for whatever childhood demon still remained to him? The next time he turned toward me, he gestured down at the floor, and in a moment the aide had pulled my arm and was escorting me toward the platform. The crowd opened as we passed, and the miners in their ignorance and jubilation were reaching to shake my hand. This was indeed a heady feeling. I climbed the steps and stood beside Cedric Bell at the smaller microphone. How is to stand above the mass of men like that? He raised his hand, and they cheered. He lowered it, and they fell silent. There is a man here today who has been immeasurably important in my life, he whispered in his microphone. There was applause, and a few of men whistled. Thank you, I said into my own. I could see the blue underbrims of five hundred hard hats turned up toward me. My heart was nearly bursting. My history teacher, he said. As the crowd began to cheer again, flashbulbs popped and I moved instinctively toward front of the platform. 
Mr. Hunter, he boomed, from 45 years ago at Richmond Central High School. It took me a moment to realize what he had said, but then he too was clapping and at the same time lowering his head in mu must have appeared to the men below to be respect for me. The blood engorged my veins. Just a minute, I said, stepping back to my own microphone. I taught you at St. Benedict's School in Woodmere, Virginia. Here is the blazer. Of course, it makes no difference in 